thing that blows me away about this. On March 29th, 2019, an online video series called The Basement Office dropped its first episode. My name is Stephen Greenstreet. I'm a journalist with the New York Post. Over the next few episodes, we're going to examine the UFO phenomenon from every possible angle. After 20 videos dropped to their YouTube's playlist over the course of about two years, production seemed to stop. But behind the scenes, the work never did. Green Street has been busy meticulously putting together puzzle pieces about alleged paranormal-themed government programs and the people that ran them. OSAP, ATIP, Werewolves, Dino Beavers, Luis Elizondo, Skinwalker Ranch, James Lekatsky, and all sorts of other breadcrumbs have been under Green Street's microscope. You can't be a year or two off. The result? A near 44-minute full-length documentary-style video to show that even though you think you know what this entire story is all about, chances are you probably don't. On top of that, it was... Stephen Greenstreet himself is about to enter the vault to showcase some of the biggest questions that arise from the contradicting evidence. So stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr. And today I am joined by Stephen Greenstreet. Now, he has just recently uh, launched his new episode of The Basement Office. Uh, it has been an, a popular online series. You've heard a little bit about it in the intro. Uh, but Stephen, thank you so much for coming back to the show and uh, taking some time with us today. Sure, of course. I love being here. And, uh, and we love having you. We always love your perspective. Obviously, The Basement Office, as I said, uh, has been a hit. A lot of people are watching it. And there was a lot of anticipation for this episode that just dropped. Now, I, I want to stress to the audience, watch it. Uh, and in fact, if you're not watching this live or the premiere, uh, go ahead and pause the video because I would encourage you to watch Stephen's uh, almost 45-minute breakdown of OSAP, ATIP, and that entire saga, because I'm not going to have him go over those points. I encourage you all to watch that, but rather we're going to talk about the making of it, the background, and what the reaction has been in this episode. So, Stephen, let me take you back, though, before you made that episode, all the way back to the beginning of the basement office. Put your mind back there. What did you want to accomplish with that series? Right. So, I, I got into the ufo game back in spring 2019 um so that would be you know around 18 months after this big bombshell story started and the snowball started down the hill and i mean honestly how the basement office came about was a, a random like statistician an analytics person came up to the video team and they said hey like this UFO story, people are searching for UFO stuff. Like maybe you should do something in video about UFOs ongoing. So they came to me and they said, pitch us an idea. And I didn't want to do like a history channel show where it was like all these recreations and like gravitas narration. Um, so I, my thought was just two dudes sitting at a desk talking about facts and evidence about UFOs. That was it. And when I, when it came to me up until that point, I was just a, a spectator. I was just a spectator to the New York Times article. And I didn't, I, I hadn't dug into any of this. I just took it at face value that what everyone in the media was saying, at least the basics were true because, you know, sometimes topics they get uh, politicized where the right you know, appropriates it and becomes a right wing issue or the left appropriates it becomes a left wing issue. But this was like a, a topic where everyone across the spectrum was regurgitating the same story. 
The Times, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, Politico, everyone was like on the basics. And so when I entered the game, I assumed wrongly, mistakenly, <laughs> that everyone in the world at least had the basics right. You know, so I, that was, I started there. Okay. This has been reported for 18 months. I'm assuming the basics are correct. So that was my launch pad was assume the basics are correct here and go from there. And it, it was, you know, weirdly right off the bat, some weird things happened, John. I mean, um, you know, I, I was asked, you know, well, you know, for our, our show, we should get our own Pentagon statement. So rather than saying CNN reported the Pentagon said or the Times reported the Pentagon said, let's be able to say the Pentagon told us. I was like, yeah, OK, great. Reached out to the Pentagon and then bam, I get two bombshells in the same email. <laughs> you know, I didn't think I was going to get anything new at that point. It's 18 months into this story. I'm just like, you know. La di da, like, hey, Pentagon, just want a statement or about a tip and Elizondo, no thanks. And then they write back saying, you know, a tip did investigate UAP and Elizondo had no responsibilities with a tip. And so just right off the bat, it was a very like head shaking moment where how is it possible? How is it possible that 18 months into this, some random dude in the basement of the New York Post sends off a generic email and gets two bombshells? Why didn't anyone else ask about this? Why was I the first to get these statements? You know, it was weird to me. It's like, wait, surely someone reported this already. And I spent weeks, uh, well, not weeks, you know, about a, about a week and a half making sure that no one else had reported that that no one else had the statement. And, you know, I interviewed you about it. If you yeah. go back to that first video, you're in it. And it was a shocking thing for the Pentagon to say at that point. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the Pentagon saying he had, Elizondo had no responsibilities. I was like, well, wait, 18 months have gone by and no one has bothered to ask this or to get this statement. And I worked on a story for weeks on the Pentagon, uh, Elizondo had no responsibilities. And um, in the emails, actually, that you FOIA'd that are on the Black Vault, uh, you can read my correspondence with Chris Sherwood. And there was this ongoing thing where he said, he was like, oh, we're going to get you his employment records. We're going to send you Elizondo's employment records. And, the you know, I was really happy about that because that's documentation, right? I could release a story and here are the documents. Here is the employment records that say this or whatever. And I was waiting on those, waiting on those. Um, I had a story. It never launched. It never aired. And then I was scooped by Keith Clore, which, you know, for anyone out there, <laughs> it's that is a unique moment. If I had mm -hmm. to like one of the more, on, and I'm not being facetious, one of the worst, most terrible days of my life was waking up on June 1st, 2019 and seeing The Intercept and Keith Clore release a story that I had worked on for like weeks and got scooped. And like my story just never published after that. Why do you, if, if you don't mind me interjecting, why do you feel that that's an important aspect to the story? Because a lot of people will argue the government lies. So who, you know, who cares what the government says? In your view, coming into the topic and seeing what you did, you did get that bombshell thing. You used the word shocked. I think that I used the same word when you interviewed me because it was shocking. They had already set up that they were not investigating UAP. Then all of a sudden, boom, you get the statement that, that they were. Yeah. Um, why was the other part of that important to you? Why did you feel that was a big story? Uh, the Elizondo had no responsibilities part? Yeah, just to get your your point of view well, at the at the time at the time history channel was promoting the unidentified show right and it was you know it was being advertised and promoted and everything and i thought it was a bombshell in of itself that mm -hmm. this story which was snowballing and was about to release a big documentary we're literally in the trailer for the history channel show it says he ran the Pentagon's top secret UFO program, like literally big graphic on screen. 
And here I have a statement from the Pentagon saying no. So obviously that's a big story and that's yeah. important. But on top of that, it was, it was weird to me that again, why I was the first one to get this statement and it inferred what that told me is no one was picking up the phone. No one was sending an email to the PAO. No, it, 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 there was this copy paste since December 2017, for the most part, a copy paste of the same story. You know, the Times reported this. Let's regurgitate it. Let's rewrite it. Let's release it. And on and on and on and on. No one was like stopping and going, let's get into the weeds on this a little bit. So I was off put by that, that I was like, why am I the first one to get this? In fact, another weird, you know, when I called the DIA, when I spoke to James Cudla, you know, and I was asking him about a tip in Elizondo, the first sentence out of his mouth from his mouth to my ears was, wow, I haven't been asked that in a long time. I haven't <laughs> been asked about that in a long time. And I was like, what really? <laughs> Your phone should be lit up every day about this. So it, anyway, I was uh, so anyway, it was a big story and there was a whole process behind. So at the time, uh, there was a PR firm handling the promotion for unidentified. Um, and when I, we first reached out to Elizondo, I didn't. We had like a, a talent outreach person at the post. OK, whose talent was finding talent you know, getting to their representatives, getting them on the phone. And she said that Elizondo, she got Elizondo on the phone and he was talkative and happy to talk. And hell yeah, let's do this. I'll do an interview with you guys. Woo! And then that got shut down like overnight. It, uh, the PR firm handling TTSA or at least the History Channel show it was a big PR firm. They emailed me and they're just like, we understand you want to talk to Elizondo. What about? And like from there, it was just me in the PR firm. And, you know, I had the this girl call Elizondo back and it was like not happening. And uh, this PR firm was like, what do you want to know? And I was like, well, I just got this statement from the Pentagon that says Elizondo had nothing to do with ATIP. And they replied, he'll talk to you off record about that. And I was like, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested yeah. in off record. I want a, I want a response and I, I would like it from him. And they were like, nope, that's not going to happen. And then they copied and pasted Kerry DeLong's statement about, you know, he started in 2010 and ATIP and, and all that stuff. And I was like, that's great. But the Pentagon is saying the opposite of that. Like, can I get better? And then they got like angry with me, <laughs> this PR firm. They're like, what's your angle here? It doesn't sound like what, like they got really defensive and um, and then when it became apparent I wasn't getting anything else, you know, I kind of went with Sherwood and I was like, look, I need more than a statement. If you have it, do you have any documentation? Is there anything I can get? Sherwood was like, we'll send you some some employment records. I'm working to get those. I think he said I'm working to get his employment records. And I was like, great. Perfect. That's you know, that helps. And then Clore's thing dropped and my story died. So from there, where did you go with this? Were you in the mindset? And this is before this recent episode, but but post, you know, the intercept, you know, got the scoop. But post that, where were you at? Were you thinking, okay, the government is really being a pain here? They're obfuscating. Elizondo's lying. Where were you at? Yes. So I was. I still had that like benefit of the doubt where I. Who was I? to say that nearly every media entity on planet earth was wrong. That's how I felt at that point. I was mm -hmm. just some video dude in the basement of the New York post. And so I did, I didn't start off on the right foot. I should have started blank slate, you know, myself and just started from there, but I didn't start from there. I started with the assumption and the benefit of the doubt that everything that's been reported globally, the basics are true. Now, I was starting to think of there, there might be something personal. And, and I, I think I even reported this or at least did an interview back in the day where I felt like people within the Pentagon had a personal issue with Elizondo and there was like, they were out to get him, 
you know, and Elizondo pushed that as well and spoke that as well. Hell, he even fired, filed a DOD IG complaint about that. So uh, there was a quote from Sherwood to me about how he's not really happy with the way they're handling this story. It was like this break. He broke out of his PAO shell and like gave me this line. And I was like, whoa, what is going on over at the Pentagon? You know, and so there was I did smell something weird there. And so I just assumed that could be what was happening. And it didn't surprise me at the time because the headspace I was in was, you know, the basic details are true. And that line he gave you was Sherwood. Uh, yeah, Sherwood, yeah. Sherwood told me, you know, I was, I was going back and forth with him about a Tim and Elizondo. And I was just like, look, what's going on. I literally was like on the phone to Sherwood. I was like, what's going on over there? Like, why is this such a tough thing? I'm asking yes or no questions. Why can't you give me yes or no answers? And he sighed and said, I'm not really happy with the way they're handling the story this story here. And I was like, Whoa, okay. Um, you're frustrated. I got it. Like there's something behind the scenes going on here. Yeah. yeah. Now, obviously now you've set up and exploring this story that there's problems in the Pentagon, but now fast forward, uh, you had, uh, again, I don't mean to beat the dead horse, but a successful run with that basement office. You know, first you had 20 videos in the, in the playlist. Mm -hmm. People have been highly anticipating, you to, to to keep going and now you've you've released your newest video uh in a nutshell w how would you describe your recent video my recent video is the culmination of at least a year plus of me losing my religion of me <laughs> it's the end result of me asking myself what if i'm wrong about all of and challenging myself to prove to myself that I'm not wrong. Because as you said, I did 20 plus episodes of The Basement saying one thing. I challenged myself to continue that, to keep going and towing that line. And I quickly discovered I couldn't do that. Video, this new episode, is the culmination of what I've discovered in the last year. And when you say challenge your belief, were you set in something and then you had a kind of moment of, of change? Yeah. Yeah. I was wrong. And I was, uh, I didn't realize it completely at the time the red flag started to appear. I was a media lackey. I was, I was a messenger boy. I was being groomed to release PR statements to the masses for disingenuous people. That's On the Pentagon side or outside the Pentagon, just to clarify? Lou Elizondo, to clarify. I was being groomed and used. That's This is just how I feel. This is my opinion. Mm -hmm. And how my imp interpretation is that there was a buddy-buddy thing happening a buddy buddy thing happening and where it's like, you know, Steve's the guy we're going to reach out to. If we have a, a message to get out there, Steve, Steve, Steve's one of the guys we're going to hit up and support because we want whatever story to hit the headlines. Um, and I slowly started to realize that. And it wasn't until I got this document sent to me in May 2021, where I went, oh, it is, it's just like my whole world collapsed. And I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, like, is that but I have to jump in. You just flashed. I'm guessing the complaint. Yeah, this is the DOD IG because you, you have a screenshot, I think, of one of the pages in your video. And that's the yeah. OK, I think that you showed that in the video. OK, so this made you have a shift it was if you go back and watch the show all the episodes you'll see if i'm critical and i ask critical questions so i was always kind of milking that uh critical side of myself but when i got the dod ig complaint which was sent to me i asked for i asked for it 
directly to Elizondo's representative who sent it to me. And I was, you know, um, and I'll never forget. It was like May 20th or something. Or maybe it was June. I stayed up till 3 a.m. Drinking scotch and just like rubbing my head. And at one point I called Tim McMillan in Germany because I knew he had it as well. And I was, I needed to talk to someone because I was just like, some of this stuff doesn't make sense to me. Like some of this stuff just isn't making sense to me. And I needed someone to like talk to, talk me through it. And, uh, because there, the story we were told in 2017 and, and since there were things in this DODIG complaint written in his words, signed with his signature that I was confused about and going like, well, wait, wait a second here. Um, and that's, that was the beginning. That was it. That was the beginning of my downfall. That was the beginning of my heresy. So what, well, okay. I have two, two, two questions very quickly. So it seems like a lot of you have gotten this IG complaint. Uh, I asked, uh, Elizondo's team, but, but that's shot down. Um, I, it was a private communication, so I'm not going to say I, I was told. No, I tried through FOIA. It was denied. How many people are getting this and, and why is the second part of that, that question. It was, hold on a sec. I just want to show you. Let's see here. Can you send me a copy of the IG complaint Bender got? Yeah. Okay. So, like, I, and I assume uh, that was either to Luis Elizondo or his PR people. So, yeah. And they sent it to me. Um, and so, I, as far as I know, Brian Bender, Tim McMillan, me, and I believe the representative told me someone at NBC also got it okay but weirdly enough weirdly enough like all of these random trolls on twitter have come out over the last two weeks claiming shocking and, and nearly proving that they also got it so it's almost like it was it was sent out to people look it was sent to people they felt comfortable with it was was there a purpose? Can I ask that? Was there a reason why they thought, okay, Stephen Greenstreet serves X purpose? Let's give it to him. What did they want? Well, look at the look at the episode of the Basement Office I released in June of 2021. That's what they wanted, and that's what I produced. It was a defensive. Uh, Lou Elizondo claims X uh, about the Pentagon and. And they're after him. And I have documentation exclusively showing that they're after him, you know, and he's running for Congress and he's the victim. You know, it was like that kind of, I mean, the behind the scenes chats were like pats on the back to me, to me. Good job, man. You, you nailed that one. You know, that kind of thing. I, I may get lambasted for, for this question by some people that are likely watching this, throwing eggs at their monitor. But did you feel or have you felt or do you feel conclusively that you were being groomed as, let's say, like an asset rather than a journalist for them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, not groomed. That word may be a little weird, but True. Um, I was being utilized as a go-to i uh, i i was in the inner circle i could pick up the phone and talk to whoever you know and get the inside stuff and there there was this feeling of i was a vessel a he's a guy we can trust to get our thing out you know and that's not uncommon I mean, sure. at all. I mean, whether you're a shoe company or a celebrity or whatever, you find your for a good PR firm finds their sympathetic voice in the media and like milks that. You yeah, know, of course. And I felt like I was becoming that and it felt gross and it felt like I was selling out. And I the things that I heard on some of those phone calls, you know, such as uh, so literally on the phone with representatives 
with Lou Elizondo telling me so and so uh, oh so and so is over there complaining that everyone seems to be making money off this except for us and and just like you know true behind the scenes stuff where it wasn't like this stately pentagon guy in a suit on cnn like yeah. just the facts joe you know that kind of thing but like behind the scenes stuff just some crazy stuff man look i'm not gonna like reveal some of these sources but i was hearing stories about like fortune tellings and predicting the future and magic and um just a whole bunch of like crazy stuff and ranting and raving and uh Did, it was just bizarre to me it's bizarre to hear uh with that um I should. I. I don't want to keep keep focusing on that because I don't want you to betray, you know, again, uh, uh, sources or, or confidential conversations. But I can obviously see where you're going, and it's very admirable. I, I know, and I've seen people say this on social media, and I'll tell you the same. Uh, it would be a lot easier for you to have gone on and and ridden that train and stayed on it oh. versus going. You know what? Uh, this isn't right. This is gross. This is making me dirty. Yeah. Uh, I, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm yeah. out. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but rather, you know, good for you, honestly, Thank because you. I can see how you could easily have a much better time uh, oh, yeah. in this conversation by staying where you were, but you saw enough to go elsewhere, which I think is telling. Yeah. And I, I've said this too, you know, in, in 2019, when I released that big story, and then when I released the first season of The Basement Office, I had like, what, 900 followers on Twitter. And then it, it was just like, boom, like I got this like outpouring of like love, adoration. Who's this new guy? The new fo this new voice. We love you. Great job. And like that could become addicting that like dopamine fix of yeah. like validation. You wake up every day to dozens of messages of people saying, they love what you do and everything you say and all this stuff that could become addicting. And I realized about a year, year and a half ago, that was disingenuous. It was, I could, dude, my life is so much easier if I don't go this way. If I just toe the line and keep repeating the yeah. statements and pushing the fantasy and the absolute delusion, if I keep doing that, who knows? Like maybe, you know, I'm hosting coast to coast in five years or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's like there was a trajectory. Words, literally words spoken to my ears from powerful type people within the niche. You you could be the new face of this. You could be the new face of this. You're going to have your own show one day. And I'm not talking New York Post. You're going to have your own show one day. These were things told to me. And... I burned all of that to the fucking ground. <laughs> <laughs> all of it. it like, cause at the end of the day, it just, there, there's a feeling I felt in my stomach, just all around where it was like, no, I'm not doing this. Like if it's not right and it's not correct, I'm out. I'm out completely. I'll walk away and I walk, I'm walking away. <laughs> How did the publishing of Skinwalkers in the Pentagon at the Pentagon um, either contribute to, alter, or reinforce where you were when that book came out uh, later last year? Right. So I love that book, man. <laughs> I love Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. So it, uh, what that did was two things. One was OSAP, which was something that I peripherally kind of understood up to that point, it really lit a fire under me to like really figure out what the hell OSAP was. And uh, I mean, James Lukatsky was like the white whale to a lot of people for the longest time. And to like read his story and his words was fascinating. And I was like, wait, there's a whole nother narrative here that got skipped over that no one talked about really. And it contradicts again, Elizondo story, you yeah, know? Yeah. So it was like yet another thing. Uh, and Lakatsky's not out there trying to be a movie star. Lakatsky's not out there trying to sell shows. Lakatsky's not out there 
you know, landing massive book deals and these things. So there was also like a level of uh, interesting legitimacy to that. It, there was almost like, I just want to tell my side of the story. And then I'm out. And, and, and more of a self-published too, you know, yeah, that it wasn't a big book deal uh, yeah. from a major publishing house with a huge advance. I mean, they did it and, and they've been ridiculed from some, some corners, but to be honest with you, I actually compliment it because yeah. they likely could have went out and gotten a big advance, but they told the story their way, which is yeah. also possibly telling. Yeah. And also look, I'm going to, I'm going to catch some crap from skeptics, but it increased my respect for George Knapp. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I am a pain in the ass to George Knapp. I know I am. I'm a huge pain in his ass, but it, it, I increased my respect for him because after Skinwalkers, you know, I went back, my journey through all of this was going back to the beginning and starting over. And when I did that, I realized I was like, holy crap, like Knapp is actually telling this story that most of the media didn't even realize till years later. Like he's actually out there saying, no, it's this and here's this and here's what happened. And the, everyone, including myself, wasn't paying attention. You know, we did, we really didn't notice the real story here. We got bits and pieces, but I don't know. I think at the, ba the basics, I think George Knapp should have written the New York Times article. And he even says he goes on podcasts. He goes on podcasts lately saying he wanted to. You know, he he had this story. He was working on it. And then he he words it as I was approached or I was informed. No, don't release your story. We're going to do it in the New York Times because that will help the issue even bigger. And he concedes that like he was like, oh, OK, well, that's kind of a good point. It'll reach a larger audience if you do it in the Times. And then he reads the Times article and he's just like, what is this? This is yeah. not the story, you know? This is, so in a weird in a weird way, like I got the book. Get, I respected George Knapp a little bit more after reading the book. Do, uh, I'm definitely not on George's Christmas list. Uh, sadly, I'm I'm not his favorite person. I still have a lot of respect for him, but I know he doesn't like me because I do have some views about how this all played out that I know that he doesn't appreciate. But there's no hiding from the fact that he had access you know he was getting these documents and putting them out there and although i'm not a fan of leaks he obviously had access to that material and i've never shied away from from that but do you believe that his access and essentially his accuracy played a role in someone telling him no we're gonna do this our way uh and and kick back because i can't help but bring up the section of your video where Leslie Kane on Showtime said that she essentially selectively omitted certain parts of, of the story. And you, I know you got a lot of flack for this, but really said, hey, is this the work of an activist or a journalist? And I think that that's a very important question here. So to go back to the root of why I'm bringing this up is, do you think that someone had an agenda to tell the story a certain way? And if so, who was that? Or was this just the journalist saying, hey, we want to do this our way and we want the credit? Yeah. So I dug into that to to see if journalists were intentionally hearing about OSAP and the werewolves and going, oh, we're not talking about that. Let's just report it our way. And I'm not sure. I, I can't say either way. I shared Leslie's on record statement from the Showtime documentary only to illustrate and she says it in her words. Yeah. My right. angle, my specific angle with this story was to give this topic credibility. And that was not the first step in getting people to accept this. So she's saying my goal with the article was to get people to believe in UFOs. But beyond that, I don't, I can't decisively say whether they avoided OSAP or didn't tell about OSAP. It could be that the melon. I mean, Mellon's on record in military.com saying, literally admitting, uh, we, we intentionally are not telling anyone about OSAP. We're leaving OSAP out of the story because that would have been counterproductive with Congress. And in a weird way, he's right, but still yeah. the whole story should be told. And Mellon and Keene go back before the 2017 New York Times article. I mean, 
Keen, I believe, was invited to sit on the board with Mellon of a some UFO company back in 2016. So, you know, these people, when you trace the family tree, these people kind of connect and know each other throughout the years. So it's, it's a safe bet to say that some, a decision was made, Hey, let's just go with UFOs. Let's just, you know what? Let's get some videos. Let's find some videos that I think are important. Let's release them. And, 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 and that's the story. And, and that'll be the story. For those um, listen, for those listening yeah. and, and watching who aren't aware, the one of the original journalists, not the New York Times, but with Politico, Brian Bender, uh, echoed on Twitter recently that he felt and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think his in exact quote was intentionally misled that he felt in the very beginning, he was told things that essentially weren't weren't 100% accurate. When you read something like that, I mean, obviously you have your own personal opinions, but they're essentially being reinforced here by people that really did dig in before anyone else dug in. And here we are X amount of years later in 2022. And that journalist who was responsible for breaking the original story on day one in, in, in addition to the New York times is saying intentionally misled. How do you interpret that? I mean, that, that takes a lot for a journalist to, to say right or am i wrong yeah it takes a lot i mean i'm saying that i know it takes a lot <laughs> to yeah. be able to say that but you know um it it has more impact coming from brian because as you say he was one of the first to break the story with exclusive information you know he he and the times almost simultaneously released their stories on that day so it's a big deal it's a big deal and you know i know brian caught flack because he eventually tr attempted to walk back some of those statements later because that that was such a huge thing for him yeah. to say. It's one thing for Steve Greenstreet to say that, but it's a whole nother level for Brian Bender to say that. And, you know, he since, you know, w walked that back, released another pro Elizondo article and is currently headlining at a UFO festival. So, you know, perhaps that initial tweet of his was like a moment of weakness. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it was, in my opinion, it was honest the way that it was said. It was a, a, a journalist that just said, hey, what I originally posted was not the full story, even though he he had me blocked for a while. There's no secret about that. Had me blocked for a while because of these types of issues. And he felt his reporting was challenged. I'm not sure what moment there was where he decided to unblock me. And I like Brian. I don't think I don't have any bad blood uh, against him or really anybody except the anonymous trolls out there. But regardless, I mean, I think that that was a big, honest moment that I think he then had to try and walk back. I'm not sure what the what the reasoning was for that. Um, in his but, walk back, uh, John, in his walk back. So he initially says. I was purposely misled I, from, you know, I was purposely misled. They didn't tell the whole story. And then in his walk back, he's like, but I still consider them credible sources. Yeah. I was and very then, confused <laughs> by that. And, and uh, then just like three days later, he writes another pro Elizondo piece releases another pro Elizondo piece. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in a microcosm, in my opinion, is I think some of these journalists experience what I experience, which is you become a minor superstar. You become a big fish in a small pond like this, like status mm -hmm. and nuking that status. You know, who knows what the outcome of that is? And I think Bender he probably didn't realize that it would get as much flack when he tweeted that. And, you know, so. Anyway, so I understand him walking that back because, like, how do you show up to a UFO festival a week after that tweet? <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't disagree there. But uh, going more broadly, I think then it's clear that there are many more people other than Stephen Greenstreet. And I'm not my, trying to minimize you, but rather reinforce the point that you're not alone, that there are a lot of people that are starting to say here 
uh, again, X amount of years later from October of 2017, when we all for the first time learned about Luis Elizondo, we have a lot of these questions that have come along with him, not only about his background within the government. I personally don't care about his personal life. I know that other people have dug into it. I don't care about that. What I care about are the stories that he's come out with and said, this is what I've done for the government. A tip is this. This is what I've done, so on and so forth. And going back to your episode, you have done an amazing amount of work, but on top of that, an amazing job putting together a 44 plus minute piece outlining all of those contradicting statements and elements. Why do you feel that there are still a lot of people that want to just ignore all that. Hey, we're getting we're getting UFO hearings next week. Who cares? Don't ask questions. Let's sacrifice accuracy here. I mean, I even saw one tweet to me directly that said uh, that they're not too concerned about accuracy. We can deal with that later. We have the hearing. I'm like, do you hear yourself? You don't care what is an illusion, a lie, a fact, or or fiction you just care about the the hearing what are your thoughts on on uh, on that entire issue here it's religious it's faith based it's faith on faith they move forward on faith we wait for the next domino it is a religion it's a it, it is a faith based organization because a flying saucer currently isn't hovering outside above my garage. Jesus Christ is also not outside hovering over my garage. We believe that what we hear and what we read is true. It's faith. So a lot of those responses are faith based and that's fine. You know, that's, that's fine. Believe what you want to believe. It's fun. It gives your life meaning. That's what religion's all about. It, it like gives your life meaning and this is what I am and this is what I believe. Fine. The only issue I have is an issue anyone would have. If, if, if the Protestant church like started influencing Congress or politicians, the media, I would step in and go, okay, well, wait a minute here. Let's, you know, what are you saying? And what, what are the big claims here? I'm fine with the belief. Let them believe whatever they want to believe. Let them be excited. Who cares? I'm not out to change that person's mind. I just want to report the facts to people who are on the fence or don't necessarily want to be part of a, a, a new religion, you know? So that was kind of like, I mean, I used to be part of an Orthodox 24 seven religion with Mormonism and I grew up Mormon and my experience leaving Mormonism eerily uncannily similar to the last year with me in ufos ask bringing up basic questions to church leaders you know like hey so what about this document about joseph smith and his fraud case in 18 whatever and and the vitriol and the that i got for even asking the question and the hatred and the ostracization and it was very similar and then you know just and i said this just because the religion is false doesn't mean God doesn't exist. That's kind of what I'm saying is this current movement is headed culturally headed by, in my opinion, disingenuous, delusional, narcissistic personalities. But that doesn't mean the phenomena is not real. I'm saying, who is your shepherd? Who is the shepherd leading you across whatever valley? And I'm saying that's the wrong path. It, it, it's all there in black and white. The story doesn't make sense. The facts don't add up. The key players keep backtracking and, 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 and flummoxing and just changing their story every other week. Come on. I mean, if we're about data and if we're about facts, what are we doing? <laughs> you know? it, do you think it's, it's, it's dangerous or just a silly way for some of these people to to operate and and i'm more focused on those that have viciously come after anybody that goes against the shepherd goes against their essentially leader i have used the c word cult many many times i believe it's fitting in this scenario 
Um, and, and, and I should point out very quickly, you have gotten an enormous amount of praise, uh, for this. So I don't want to make it seem like, oh my gosh, you're just being attacked by every corner. Th that's not even close to being true. Uh, but rather you're experiencing something where the one voice can outweigh the compliments of a thousand and, and you multiply that one voice by, a thousand congregation members, you know, that are coming at you. So is this something that's dangerous or do you just think this is a social media thing? It's potentially dangerous. Look, when you look at like the QAnon movement, for example, yeah. uh, there was that like Pizzagate conspiracy theory where like yeah. a guy showed up with a gun and just started shooting into this pizzeria because like QAnoners were saying that like Satanists were in the basement or something like that. So yeah, it, of course, it's dangerous. Of course, it could lead to dangerous. And 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 organize and group belief groups like this do tend to attract mentally ill, low IQ, fantasy prone, angry people. It, it, that's just history. Yeah, <laughs> that's just normal thing that happens throughout history. And so, while not every Christian is going to go bomb an abortion clinic there are people attracted to that kind of group setting that validates their fantasy that will react violently so could it be the answer is of course yes obviously i want to stress it's not the majority of people out there it's a small percentage but it, it, to me i've been concerned about it for some time i appreciate your thoughts on it i've just seen the rhetoric grow to be more warlike, you know, uh, banding together, band of brothers, call to arms. Uh, we're in a war. We're in a battle. Um, I won't say some other exact quotes because I'm not trying to out anybody. But regardless, that rhetoric, I hope people really kind of tone it down a little bit because I there was a time where QAnon was never thought to show up on the Capitol steps and storm inside and look what happened. So these these movements can grow and it really is up to the shepherds to speak out against it and to be honest with you i'm not seeing the shepherds speak out against it but that's yeah. my gripe and maybe a different show and conversation yeah, yeah there is a trumpian um there is there's a weird thing happening right now with the the faces and leaders of this group it almost egging on this growing vitriol yeah um because that growing vitriol is a wall that they can hide behind it's uh you know and instead of facing the facts and owning up to things being transparent they're being sneaky and childish and look if this was any other topic other than ufos it would be in my opinion a much bigger deal but it's kind of a stupid thing. It's kind yeah. of a stupid topic about stupid things and people choosing stupid battles with, you know, where the end, the end prize is also something stupid. You know, it's like no one's, I don't see any wi win here, any big win with whatever silly battles being fought uh, right now, you know, in. Uh, right. But they're, day. but they're, but they're stressing that rhetoric nonetheless. And in my opinion, it's growing. And, and that's to where, where they, and again, I, I feel it may be a different conversation, but where I worry that there is that very, 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 very small percentage of people that will put themselves in a position where they feel that they've won. And you see that type of talk online. And it, for me, it sheds a different light on somebody that is going on. I mean, this has been talked about here in the last four to six weeks or so about sock puppet accounts. And mm -hmm. Luis Elizondo himself admitting that this is what he does. He collects intelligence when he was asked and confronted with that question. So how many identities are we dealing with? Uh, and I'm obviously getting away from the danger part, but rather the sneaky part that you just referenced. Right. That, that, that there's something that I want to point out very quickly that under my name, or excuse me, under my picture here as those who are watching on YouTube is my real name. Under your face here on YouTube is your real name. We yeah. don't hide behind silly, you know, acronyms and this and that. And we put ourselves out there and go, this is what we believe. But that, that, that shepherd, so to speak, the leader of, of that movement that is coming out after people like us 
has openly admitted that he's collecting intel through alternate identities. That should be more disturbing than people want it to be. But it but it is, uh, as my dog's getting in on the show here. But I, I don't know what your thoughts are. We don't have to talk about it. But I wanted to throw that out there, that this has become an issue, and it is not getting better. Yeah. I, yeah. It's a... An issue. Look, if this was, if the topic, if an ex Pentagon official was doing this to garner support for the war in the in Ukraine, if it was revealed that an ex Pentagon official had sock puppets accounts and he was influencing people to bolster support for mil U.S. military presence in in the Ukraine, holy crap, would that be huge, right? Or pick any other actually important social issue any of them if this was revealed on that level big but it's so silly yeah <laughs> that, it's, that it's like about ufos but not even just you about ufos but to protect this guy's lie that he ran a pentagon ufo program that's what we're talking about it's so low on the things that are actually important in life that it's 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 that's why I was laughing just a second ago. It's almost laughable at how pathetic it is. Yeah, it's pathetic. It's so bizarre and pathetic. And you know, look at the CNN the other day. This is fascinating, right? We're you, me, uh, UFO Twitter. We're all in this little bubble, and so many people stay in that bubble. They just live there, and they yeah. and pretty soon they they just think that's their that's reality, right? But outside of that bubble is this, the real world. And, you know, CNN tweeted the other day about Congress holding hearings about UFOs. And they got ratioed. If you look at, like, the comment responses from people in the real world, they were like, the Supreme Court is, like, nixing abortion rights for women. And this is what Congress is doing. Yeah. WTF Congress. What kind of wackos in Congress are? This is a real issue. We have a war going on. We have mo taxpayer money going to that war. I mean, it was just like the real world, an introduction to what's really happening in the real world about important things. That's that's what the rest of the world thinks of this UFO Twitter thing and this UFO thing. The majority of the people are just rolling their eyes and the shepherds are not helping change that all you know it's like it's not legitimizing it tim uh, not talking about it is not legitimizing it lou elizondo talking about it is not legitimizing it chris mellon is not legitimizing and destigmatizing this at all despite what people in the bubble think the real world still isn't convinced i i would only respectfully say that i believe for quite some time from the beginning on i don't know what the turning point was they were but with the yeah. caveat that we learned later, we weren't being told the whole truth. Right. And, and that's one thing in your video that I think you really show that not only is the media inept when reporting about this, but one thing that, and, and I see the normal characters always responding to this, but right back to the beginning with the name discrepancy. That although, you know, Lou Elizondo was right, it was aviation or excuse me, aerospace versus aviation. Uh, what you're showing is it was probably neither and it wasn't really even a program at all, but rather just a nickname and so on. And I think you do a really good job doing that. Uh, and again, we don't have to go over it over it here. But I think that that really showed the 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 first indicator that there was a problem that this right. wasn't as reported and even though you know i get i get still uh three plus years later for posing those questions i don't care i don't have a single regret it does not matter who was right or wrong but rather i knew at that point that there was something to this why was the pentagon wrong that intrigued me more you know why why was there such misinformation about this go ahead good stuff this is great stuff and uh, let me start by saying everyone go back and read brian bender's december 16th 2017 political article it's it's awesome it's awesome compared to the keen piece the Kane piece the leslie Kane piece it's awesome there's some great stuff in there i think people forgot about 
Now, I think what happened is the Pentagon themselves is confused uh, because, you know, it's established there on the record, Lekatsky, et cetera, Reed, they were hiding this. We don't want everyone in the Pentagon to know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> you know, they say this like we, you know, Lekatsky says people in my own office right around me, they had no idea I was running Skinwalker Ranch and uh, you know, Reed, they were worried it was going to come to light. They write, Reed writes this letter saying, Hey, let's take this program special access, which would limit it. How many people have had access. And he, it actually says right there on his letter, nickname, the nickname for the program. He says it right there, a tip. And this was the, and then that letter was according to those on the inside leaked. The letter was spread everywhere. So now yeah. everyone that doesn't know about this program is suddenly reading about this program nicknamed a tip, but this is an official document now. Right. And so they're going to write a summary of this meeting. So let me write a summary of this meeting. Senator Reed came in to talk about a tip, uh, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly OSAP is not mentioned. OSAP is not, suddenly not mentioned at all. It's just, they're just basically just re regurgitating what Reed says in the letter. ATIP is suddenly created at that point. And so I think the Pentagon, that was the first time they, a lot in the Pentagon had even heard of this program too. And but, according but, to some, it was ATIP. So, so let me ask you though, aside from the ASA, OSAP ATIP part of this, the story as you just brought up from those that are telling this from the inside, say that that, that letter circulates and people go, oh my gosh, we can't have this program, and that killed it. What in that Harry Reid letter would tip anybody off that there was anything to do with UFOs or the paranormal? Well, it's not the letter. It's, um, from what I, I understand, is there were a few who knew what it was. Um, I mean, if you believe uh, Lakatsky, Kelleher, and Knapp, and Reid's stamp of approval, William Lynn, who the letter is addressed to, got the letter, went into the meeting going, is this about those damn flying saucers? That's a direct quote from from the book. So obviously he had some kind of rumor idea about what these guys were up to. But also there was a process. All right. You can't just get a sap. You can't just, hey, can I have a sap? Yeah, no problem. Here you go. But yeah. you can't just do that. You have to go through a process. A back and forth, an analysis of a program. What is it all? And remember, at this point, at this point, they had been sent per Bass and per Lekatsky, been sending the Pentagon some pretty crazy reports, some pretty nutty stuff, you know, like Skinwalker Ranch, you know, like there's a, um, uh, you know, there was like hundreds of pages about a haunted house in Indiana, you know. This is per Bass and per the sources. And so the Pentagon is getting this stuff and, you know, reviewing and seeing this stuff. Do you, do you, I'm running out of time and there is something I want to cover with you, but really quickly, do you really think that those reports went to quote unquote, the Pentagon or just Lekatsky? And the second part of that uh, is if you do believe that the select few outside of James Lekatsky's office saw this, then, then the allegation, nobody deals with this, then the allegation has to become that the Defense Intelligence Agency, as a arm of the intelligence community and the military, went to Senator John McCain and lied. Now, I know that a lot of people go, well, they always lie, so who really cares? No, when you lie to a senator asking about a primarily unclassified program, and you completely omit all of that stuff and leave a senator in the dark, um, what are your thoughts on that? Because don't you have to have that conversation then? Okay. Yeah. So let me start with that first and then I'll go back. So I, again, and this is just my opinion is I don't think it was a lie. Like I, when you follow the breadcrumbs and you follow the puzzle pieces as they occur throughout the last decade plus, you see how the DIA and how the Pentagon could seriously not know 
about all this other crazy stuff. Skinwalker, the ins and outs of the werewolves. It's very possible not everyone was told. Um, in the actual OSAP contract, which you can look at, it asks for the DIRDs, essentially, these technical reports. Now, it doesn't specifically ask for the ones that were turned in, but those were the ones that were asked for. We're paying you to produce this. You sent us that. That's all we're going with. Um, so I could see how years later, the DIA could go through their paper and go, oh, here's a thing called ATIP. Oh, yeah, yep, Harry Reid, ATIP. Yep, this is it. And, and here are the reports that were released. And just going with what they had, the information they had, there is very clear that information was withheld. And that was somewhere along that line, key information with, was withheld. And I have learned to pull back on the gas on mm -hmm. blaming the Pentagon. I used to be a big Pentagon blamer and something's up and Susan Goff is up to no good. And, um, you know, these they're in on it and stuff. And now I'm just realizing, I'm like, well, wait a minute. What if, what if they just didn't know? Like, I mean, Lekaski's admitting it that he was not telling them that he was yeah. hiding it from them. So that's a possibility. So, you know, maybe they're also as confused about all this. Now, I will say that the official DIA documents that were released via FOIA recently acknowledge in black and white receipt of some of those non derv reports. I mean, it says we don't know who prepared that document. I assume Lekatsky. But, you know, monthly reports, com comprehensive reports. We received this and we're asking for more. And then when you look at Skinwalkers, oh, the monthly report about Skinwalker, Skinwalker, spooky stuff, you know. So it's uh, the DIA has documents saying it. Someone got those. Yeah. And further, I want to continue that part of the conversation, but I'm running out of time with you and I want to get to something very quickly for those who are wondering. I have an open appeal for exactly what Stephen just said uh, and trying to get the DIA to go on the record on what else, if anything, on OSAP that they are planning to release. But regardless, I am fighting on an appeal process to try and get those those very reports. So I don't dismiss it as much as some people think that I do. Uh, I go regardless of, of my personal thoughts. But in the last couple of minutes uh, that I have with you, Stephen, next week uh, is the UFO hearing. Uh, very quickly, do you support those types of hearings? Yeah, sure. I, I, that's great. Look, <laughs> I, I wasn't I, convincing. <laughs> look, look, I've said it for a while. I think at the end of the day, one of the silver linings of all of this is I think a real problem might accidentally be addressed. We have an airspace awareness problem. We have an airspace safety problem. We possibly have a national security issue with foreign agents flying over infrastructure in the United States. All real problems. And I think this whole UFO flap and this whole UFO thing might accidentally address some of those problems. Uh, you know, so if there's hearings about unidentified flying objects over critical infrastructure, near misses with commercial airlines, hell yeah let's let's do that i just hope that they're not dumping most of their time and resources into looking for spooky stuff because then that's just all sap all over again you know it was like we're making the same mistake again it's cyclical man i mean you know this more than anyone like yeah. you look back in history this is all a cycle blue book and condom report and then start over and it's this sick. is playing out very identically to the mid to late 60s there's there's no there's no doubt about that but i want to take you back to the analogy that you were using with religion that even though you question certain i'm paraphrasing here but you question certain aspects of religion doesn't necessarily mean that god doesn't exist right. so translating that to today uh the stephen green street uh that we all know uh, uh know and love here do you believe the phenomena, these phenomena or phenomenon, if you only think there's one aspect, is explainable given proper evidence and it's all Earth-based, either drones, uh, technology, classified arena material, stuff like that? Or do you believe there's a chance that the, we are dealing with an extraterrestrial connection to some of this? Yeah, I... Uh... I think there are real UFO cases that are real UFO cases that defy logic and explanation. There's no doubt. And I have, 
privately talk to people who I really respect who have had really weird stuff happen. So it, the possibilities there, I don't think it's a political issue. I think a, I would start personal issue. It's personal. There's something, if it's real, it's something personal. And if it's beyond that, it's something scientific. I just, uh, we shouldn't be lobbying Congress, but like the fair weather politicians, we should be lobbying like the National Institute of Science and some of the biggest science, in, in, you know, conglomerates in the, in, in the world. Um, and so, yeah, I do believe something's there. Uh, I don't know what the heck it could be. Maybe it's explainable. I've heard some weird stuff. I saw a weird thing myself. You know, I saw a weird UFO myself that I can't explain, even though there, it had some prosaic qualities. I still can't explain it. Was this the recent one that you had posted That's and no. I had? No, no, that one was just cool. And then you I can't lay this on me when I'm out of time, Stephen. <laughs> oh, I did an episode on this. I saw my um, my big triangle. There's an episode of, a long time ago in, in the basement office, season one, episode four. I go into my UFO uh, sighting with Nick Pope. Okay. Um, and yeah, I can't look. The only thing about that that was extremely creepy was the. It looked like two sticks, black sticks stuck together like that. There was no back or body, just two sticks, blue lights, and no sound flying through the air like that. Um, and no sound. That was the creepy thing. It could have been a balloon, but the wind was blowing this way and it was flying this way and a straight line. So that the feeling I had when I saw that was unique. It was, you know, that cold kind of like, whoa, what is this? Like you a know? Phoenix Lights type of arrangement or? Like a Phoenix Lights, uh, way smaller than the proclaimed Phoenix Lights object. Um, yeah, very similar. I'll have to, to I'll, I'll link it in the show notes too, because uh, I don't recall that part of the, or that episode of episode four. So I'll make sure that that's in the show notes. Is that your only experience um, uh, UFO wise? Because I know that you had another one recently. That's what I thought you were referring to, where UFO you felt level. that it was a certain type of drone. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and the reason why I like to dig into to stuff like this is obviously there is this aura that you just think everything is a drone. And I personally don't think that's how you think. Well, uh, but that's why I, I always kind of dig a little bit and stuff like this. Another admission, another confession is uh, a lot of folks who are into this topic or who get into this topic have a history of already being into this topic, some kind of history. That was me. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I was, uh, I, when I was 12, I got Crash at Corona by Stan Friedman from the library and read it all. I read Bud Hopkins abduction books, intruders, the like. This is when I'm like early teens. Um, and I was always into sci-fi and things. When I grew up and became an adult, I left most of that in my childhood. And it really wasn't until December, really in December 2017, where I was like, okay, I guess my childhood is back, you know, I'm going to get into this. Um, but at the beginning of all of this with me is a experience that I think was a dream, which I, I've only told a few people in my whole life, this experience. And I really mean, I've only told a few people. Um, so Again, prefacing with it that it was a dream, though a vivid one. I'm five years old, five or maybe, yeah, five or six years old. And I'm in South Carolina, in our home of South Carolina. The vision or dream or memory starts like this. I'm standing in the doorway of my bedroom, which I shared with my brother. I'm facing into the door, into the bedroom. I can't move. I'm paralyzed. I'm standing there and I can't move. My brother is in bed screaming. A bright white light is coming through the window. I hear a hum. Uh, and it, it, this is all being interpreted as a, in my five-year-old brain. So I thought it was a fan because my parents used to run fans as white noise. 
Uh, so my interpretation was like, I heard this hum and a white light and then a ghost came out of the closet and took my brother out the window. And then, and then I, and then that's the, like, that's the end of the vision. And it was a goat. And so in my five-year-old brain, it was a ghost because I, it was the Disney ghost because it had this big white head with big black eyes. And so my five-year-old brain at that point interpreted it as this like ghost. And it was weird later on. And as I would grew up, the memory would, the dream would stay there. And I think I saw someone had close encounters of the third kind on. And when they show the aliens in the movie, I was like, that's the ghost. That's the ghost I saw. You know, like I, my little child brain had never seen a great, you know, this, these gray aliens or like these, these things before. So I, I did, had no connection. I interpreted it as this ghost, but I remember close encounter. Someone's while I was like, that's the ghost I saw. That's the ghost I saw take my brother out a window. Now, um, <laughs> you know, I was five at the time, so I could have had just like some kind of waking nightmare or there could have been a sci-fi movie on that my older siblings were watching that scared me. And it was like somewhere in my head. And but um, I can't remember any other dream that I had when I was five years old that vividly. I don't think anyone can, but I can still remember this, you know. Have you ever done? Yeah, I can't think of any that I've ever had. Have you ever asked your brother? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've asked about it. In fact, weirdly, yeah, and we just like laugh about it, you know. So <laughs> he, like, hey, I man, mean, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people are asking, did he, re did, like, does he ever have a, a dream like no. that or remember anything? No, okay, nothing, nothing. And you know, I, you know, when you research supposed abductions, there are repeater, what's so called repeaters, where it, it, it's not just like one time. Usually, it's usually like more than once. Um, but like, no, I never had anything like that ever again. Nothing. You know, I talked to my brother about it. I was like, dude, were you abducted by aliens? Do you have any memories? And I wasn't like joking. I was like, you know, asking him. I was like, obviously not. You know, that that didn't happen. One weird thing, though, and this is still somewhere in my brain, is um, I remember weirdly that after that experience, when I was a kid, I had this distinct impression that my brother wasn't my brother. <laughs> I was like, you know, it was, it was like in the weeks and months after that, I was like, dude, I saw you, I saw you get taken out a window. Who are you? Like you, it was this kind of like kid mentality where I was trying wow. to, I was trying to connect, like, how is it possible that I saw you get scooped up out a window and yet the next morning you're here. You're here. You know, so as a kid, I remember a little kid, I'm a little kid at this point, um, the feeling, I don't remember the specific memories, but I remember the feeling of like, how is he here when I saw him go? You know, that kind of thing. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. This is my last question because I've already blown past the time frame that you gave me. So thank you for uh -huh. being gracious with your time. How convinced are you that was a dream? Really convinced. Oh, so 100% you just feel it was a cool dream? Yeah. Well, I don't yeah. cool, but you know what I mean. But also, you know, you have to consider that memory is malleable. And um, the way I remembered it 20 years ago could be different than the way I remember it now. And I just think this is fresh and this is new. It could have morphed. I've told the story. And as you tell stories, little details drop in and little things happen and evolve and embellish. So I'm open to the fact that maybe the original memory or dream that I had when I was five was totally different. And my brain is just interpreting, you know, a memory is just remembering the last time you remembered it. That scientists have shown that a memory is just remembering the last time you remembered it. It's not going all the way back to your five. It's just the last time you remembered it. And so, yeah, it could have changed. Uh, but I'm a hundred percent sure, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's good enough for me, man. Hey, again, thank you for sharing that. I really do appreciate it. And overall, thank you for the work you did. Uh, I really appreciate you digging in to the part where you felt that you were on the inside, but realized, hey, you know what? This isn't right. And I commend you for that. And I know you and I will uh, not agree on 100% of everything, but at the end of the day, 
we have a hundred dollar bet on at least one debate that we're having. Uh, so I look forward to figuring out who's going to win that hundred dollar debate. And I hope it's more great. people do that in the uh, <laughs> debate sphere. Yeah. No, no reason to sling mud. Just yeah. put your money where your mouth is. Stephen <laughs> and I have a hundred dollar uh, bet on hopefully uh, uh, what is underneath those shapes yep. in the classified UAP report. So I'm trying hard to prove that for nothing else other than that 100 spot that you're about to pay <laughs> me. So, uh, but honestly, man, I, I blew over my time. Thank you so much yeah. for your time and your work. I hope everybody takes some time to watch your video. You put an enormous amount of work in that and it shows not only the research, but the editing as well, well done. Uh, and it's hard for me to say stuff like that. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you all for listening and watching. Please help the show. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And of course, watching on the audio version of this, whatever pl uh, platform that you're listening on, make sure you sit and stick a review on there. It helps as well. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you all for listening and watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.